master rare capacities through uh, a spot and call attention to issues that are under discussed uh, despite their criticality. And B, synthesize core messages that can raise awareness and reflection in our field. Without further ado, I it's a great pleasure to invite both to share some of their reflections on the topic. We will start with Mark, then we move to Eric, straightforward. Then uh, I will kind of invite three PhDs to ask uh, questions to the two presenters, and then we open for a broader debate with the wider audience. Okay. All right, good morning. Thank you for having me from afar. Um, as Leo said, we're going to be talking about research ethics and integrity. And I guess the way we're going to do this is that Eric and I each come at this from different perspectives. Um, I think we agree on an awful lot more than Eric would like. Um, but one of perhaps the key differences is, and this might be more about our current responsibilities than anything else, but I'm coming at this from the perspective of a journal editor. And as Eric pointed out, a lot of my discussion is preventative. Um, and Eric comes at this, I believe, as a self-confessed data sleuth. Um, and his perspective is much more about rooting it out. Um, and so it, I'm going to talk first from the preventive perspective. Eric's going to talk from the catching it perspective, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, each of us is going to take about 20 minutes, and that'll leave plenty of time for a good discussion at the end. Um, to be really clear, we're talking about the integrity of the research process, and hence the validity and reliability of the results of both individual studies and our entire knowledge base. So we're not talking about the ethical review component of doing research. That's clearly important, but that's just a tiny slice of this picture, and it really you can certainly get ethical board approval and then do some really appalling things after you have it. So we're much more interested in um, actions such as outright fraud. So when people fabricate data, things of that nature, um, questionable research practices uh, such as p-hacking and so on. Um, and the point being that when authors engage in those activities, we would suggest pretty much everyone else loses. Um, so that's our focus. What I'm gonna talk about in my period of time and I, is why you should care. Then I'm going to share some of the examples of what I've seen. I think, unfortunately, we sometimes pretend that this stuff just happens elsewhere. So one of the pleasures of being a journal editor is you get to see lots of stuff other people might not necessarily see. So I'm going to share some examples of things that are highly unethical in some cases um, to outright fraud in our own discipline. And then I'll spend some time talking what, about what I think we should do about it when we're in gatekeeping roles, whether that's as editors, reviewers, people on exam committees, and so on or what we might do in our wider role as members of the community. So why should you care? This is kind of my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, first and foremost, you know, one of the reasons that people are able to dismiss any scientific belief or any scientific knowledge is that some percentage of that knowledge is wrong. Now we know that that's part of the scientific process, right? We learn by doing, we learn by testing and retesting and some of the things we believe to be true aren't. However, some of the scientific knowledge is wrong because the people who created it engaged in questionable, unethical or truly fraudulent practices. In other words, one of the reasons that people are able to dismiss scientific knowledge and scientific expertise full stop is because of the behaviors that some of the members of the scientific community, which is us, have engaged in. When we think about that from the perspective of our own discipline, what does that mean? It means that the foundations of our knowledge base in supply chain management, or purchasing and supply management, um, are shaky at best. In other words, some of our theories, facts, and predictions are based on 
what was likely questionable at best research. And because we do so little replication and so little proper follow-up testing, we've built edifices on top of this. In other words, we are, like every other discipline, we are bound to have some seminal studies that are not just wrong, but they are wrong because of things the researchers did on purpose to get published. The end result of that is that one of the reasons that our research is often treated as not valuable or useful or impactful is because the knowledge base can't be trusted. If the knowledge base isn't trustworthy, why would you bother listening to these people? Now, if none of that matters to you, if you're just here, <laughs> and I'm guessing if you got up this morning after the conference dinner, that the, the last level probably is not you, but just in case, you know, if none of that matters to you, at the end of the day, if people are engaging in these behaviors because it gets their work published, they're in essence reducing your odds of getting published doing the right things, which should, if nothing else, be pretty annoying. So I would suggest you should care deeply about this. Hopefully you do. I'm guessing you do or you wouldn't be here. Um, so let me share some of the things I've seen. Uh, so in about six years of being a journal editor, when I took over, I expected that I would see plagiarism and self-plagiarism. I have to admit that I'm surprised that I see as much at JSCM as I see with my students. Um, so it happens all the time. And we have frequent serial offenders, which to me is just beyond belief. Um, like, you know, after we've sent you one rejection letter that says, hey, the high percentage of your manuscript seems to be plagiarized, you would think you'd get the message, right? If you have a PhD, you should be smart enough to fix that. Um, perhaps worse, self-plagiarism is frequently accompanied by stealth inappropriate data reuse. What I mean by that is that one of the questions we ask and pretty much every journal asks is for authors to give full transparency about if the data used in this paper has been used in previous papers. And we far too often have authors tell us, no, this data has never been used in anything else before. The plagiarism checker says 40% of the content in this paper is cut and paste from the same author's previous work. And oh, by the way, it's the method section describing the data. Um, so we see a lot of that. And then we see lots of evidence of p-hacking, so where people do inappropriate things to get their results to go from 0.06, which is somehow magically useless, to 0.05, which is magically awesome. Um, so all sorts of things to get themselves to statistically significant results. Um, we see lots of parking, so hypothesizing after the results are known, um, where you write the paper backwards, lots of data dredging and the like. I expected these things. Um, I probably see more of it than I wanted to. Things that still surprise me, even after six years. Um, we see all sorts of variations on the trying to slice the bologna as thin as we can. Um, perhaps the most fun version of this I've seen um, and the most annoying when it was found was that what it looked like happened, and remember, I can't accuse anybody of anything, um, because this could have all been a very honest mistake, but what it appears to have happened is that the authors did a single experiment, wrote up the single experiment, and sent it to two journals simultaneously in kind of a fishing expedition to see which one would be more interested in it. And then they got lucky and both journals gave them a revision opportunity going in different directions, and so they ran with it. Um, and for whatever reason, the other journal was paper, went, moved faster than JSM. I'm gonna claim because they had lower standards. But the end result was that they had two papers that had the same framing, the same basic initial experiment, and then went in different directions from there. That's glorious, right? Um, two publications for the price of one, who loses? Other fun examples, we've seen this a few times where people send us a paper um, and what it again appears to have happened is that they were collecting data and they got to some end that they thought was big enough to get published. So they did. So let's say they got to a sample size of 200, they 
wrote the paper, they published it somewhere else, and they kept collecting data. And then they sent us the same paper, same framing, same research question, but now the sample size was 250 from the same population using the same constructs and with 200 out of the 250 being used in the previous paper. Sure, that's grand, right? We learn a lot from doing that. Um, in fairness, we have problems in other parts as well. Uh, we've had incidents where, and the one I'm thinking of here, the one I was thinking of when I wrote the slides, where we've made a mistake in the journal office and we've asked somebody to review a paper we probably shouldn't have because they had clear conflicts of interest. And the one I'm thinking about is one of the people who I would have up till this event classified as one of our better reviewers, but a really tough reviewer. In other words, they're very thorough, they're very developmental, but they never like anything. Every paper comes back as needing a massive revision with lots of suggestions on how to improve it, except for the one time I accidentally sent them a paper from one of their co-authors. And all the comments were about how this was the most awesome paper ever written. The best awesome, great, perfect. I wish I had done it. Well, of course you wish you had done it. This is the one paper you didn't write with them. We get frequent requests to guest edit a special issue where the people who are suggesting the special issue also then tell us whose papers they're gonna be publishing, sometimes with complete titles. In other words, these papers need not go through the review process. They're already done and selected. What could possibly go wrong, right? And I can keep going. Um, this is my chance to rant and rave after six years of looking at this. My point is there is an awful lot going on behind the scenes that you may or may not be aware of. And a lot of it is, again, undermining the trust in the scientific process, undermining our knowledge base, and creating a perception that our research is useless. So rant over. What do we do about this? Um, we all play gatekeeper roles, whether it's my gatekeeper role as an editor, you as a reviewer, you as a member of an exam committee, and so on, right? And so when we're in those gatekeeper roles, there are things we can do and need to do. First and foremost, especially when we're talking about papers going through the review process, or when you're listening to a job talk or whatever, demand transparency. If you can't figure out things like what they did with missing data, did they have outliers and what did they do with them? What controls are in the model? Was this all the data you collected? Were these all the hypotheses you tested? If any of those things are missing, ask. Because unfortunately, you have to assume that this information, if it's missing, that it's a sin of commission, not a sin of omission. Um, because frequently people know they're doing things that are marginal at best, and their way of dealing with it is using vague language, writing around it, not talking about it, and hoping they get away with it, and hoping they get far enough along in the review process that we then feel bad about rejecting their paper when we eventually figure it out. So you have to demand transparency. Do not progress papers. Do not progress students until you get it. When you're in other positions, so I wrote this as editors, but I was thinking about this this morning, right? It's not just editors. So as, as an editor, I need to educate, and I do. And I also stop using, if need be, reviewers who encourage poor practices. In other words, when a reviewer writes something like, you need more significant results, and anybody who's done hypothesis testing research has probably gotten that review at some point in their life. That review is appalling. That review is encouraging you to go look for significant results as opposed to important results. Um, those reviewers need to be stopped. Equally reviewers who want you to cite their papers, um, especially when they tell you that you've missed 18 papers to cite and it's all got the same first author, that's problematic. Now, this is mostly my job, but you should not feel bad about this as an author when you get one of these reviews to flag it, especially if it's at a journal where they publish a very large volume of papers. In other words, where the editors probably are not able to pay close attention to each individual review. They don't know what's going on. They need your help in this matter. Now, this is all very punitive. I would prefer to be a bit more positive. So there are some, some carrots we can offer to hopefully improve practice. 
One is that we have to embrace or recognize open science, whether that's the sharing of data, the using of registered reports, preferably both at once. Um, and if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that many of the journals in our discipline have started to encourage this. JSCM, JOM, both are now having open research badges. This is like, you know, a gold star for doing good. I would suggest in the future, you're going to be asked to do these things. Equally, if you look at management science, they've spent, I think, the last four or five years asking people to provide their data, to provide their code. I would assume that that's going to slowly transition. Well, actually, slowly. It's been long enough. It's probably going to transition relatively soon to you have to provide your data, at least for review purposes. We may or may not publish it because of anonymity issues, but it's going to have to be available. So you should embrace that. Embrace and recognize replications. Again, this is something that is really important for strengthening those foundations of our knowledge base. That if we don't do replications, we never know whether or not the results of a study, even if it was the best conducted study ever, it could still be wrong. We need to test that. And you again, you're seeing that there is more of a welcomeness to replications in the discipline. Both JOM and JSCM have made it very clear that we would like to see more of this. Focus on the rigor of the design and effect sizes, not whether or not P equals 0.05, right? Or is less than 0.05, right? That this is one of the things that you as a reviewer, you as a reader should be much more interested in. Was this research conducted well? Not are the results significant, because insignificant results matter as well, right? Don't forget that all research has flaws. Um, one of the things that continues to surprise me <coughs> is the number of papers I've written a conditional acceptance to where I tell the authors, okay, the one thing that's really missing here is your limitations section is bullshit. You need to be very clear about the things that are actually flawed in your paper. This is a paper I'm going to publish, and still the authors push back. Um, and that's because we, as a discipline, pretend that research can be perfect. It can't. Every paper's got problems. Every paper's got limitations. We need to reward people who are upfront about what their research can do and equally about what it cannot do. Right, limitations are just opportunities for future work. We should all embrace that. That's good for us, right? Um, and finally, you know, I've talked about harking this, you know, hypothesizing after the results are known, going fishing in your data, data dredging, and so on. The real problem with that behavior is that it's typically done in a secret manner, serendipitously, and then, sorry, wrong word choice, right? In a subversive manner, secretly, and then the papers written up as if these were the hypotheses we always meant to test, as opposed to these were the significant results we found. That said, when people do this in a transparent manner, typically as post hoc tests, that can be very useful. In other words, you built your research design, you tested your hypotheses, and what you found was totally unexpected. So then you went back to the data and you're very clear about this. We went back to data and we did some digging around and we tried to figure out why, and this is what we think is going on. Presenting it in that manner is useful for building the knowledge base, but those post hoc tests don't have the same rigor. They don't have the same theoretical underpinnings that the hypothesis test did, and they have to be presented and treated differently, right? So there's nothing wrong with transparent arcing as long as it's presented as such. Finally, last couple things, mentors. First and foremost, this sounds easy. Don't engage in these practices and don't expect your junior colleagues to do so e either. Maybe a more subtle version of this, and this is, I keep thinking back to my own PhD experience. The number of times I heard as a PhD student, a faculty member say something of the nature of what's on the slide, right? If you torture the data long enough, they will confess. It will confess. It will give you the results you wanted. You heard that over and over again. And I'd like to believe, maybe in a delusional world, that this was done mainly in a facetious manner, in jest. But the reality is, if you hear that every week as a PhD student over four or five years, you start to believe that's how you're supposed to behave. 
just like when you hear discussions of publishing as just a game and how do I play the game? Because if it's a game and we're playing and the goal is just to get publications, then how we go about getting those publications becomes far less important, right? So the language we use, the way we discuss how we do research really matters. And this matters much more as we move into mentor roles, right? If you wanna think about this a little bit differently, if you as an advisor are mostly advising people to do meaningless or low impact work just to get published, you're not being a good mentor. You're not helping that person, you're not helping yourself, you're not helping the discipline. Instead, I would suggest is that we have to train people in what is or is not appropriate behavior. One of the things that and I, of course, I get to go first. So the, I've seen the early version of Eric's slides. He may have addressed this because he knows what I'm going to say now, is that his school has actually helped me a lot with training PhD students. And that one of the things they've created is their ethical dilemma game, which is a great way to start discussing these issues with students and early career researchers. So that's one of the things I do with PhD students. Um, Equal, I'd suggest that, you know, best practice in supply chain management or operations management is to be preventative, to control the process and to then be sh relatively sure if the process is working, the outcomes will be what you want. Well, if we design research to be rigorous and robust and we conduct it in that fashion, then the outcome should be good and good being your Unfortunately, for a lot of people, you get your papers published. In other words, sure, there's a random component to the review process. And sure, some papers will not end up where you'd like, and some papers will seemingly be blessed, and so be it. But if over the course of your career, you manage the process correctly, the outcomes will follow. And so when we start talking about the game and we focus on the publications, we're focusing on outputs as opposed to focusing on the process. So focus on the process, please. Finally, as co-authors, um, you know, when someone crosses a line, you gotta call them out. My experience suggests that a lot of people have been trained in a manner where this is just a game. And so you need to be clear to them why it matters in general, to you, to them, um, Eric might revel in the most recent retraction watch updates, but you won't if your name is on it. Or if your supervisor's name is on it, and then you try and go get a job because you are implicated by being related to that human in a sense, right? But we also have to give people incentives to change, right? Be clear that there are other ways. Talk about open science. Discuss articles on the replication crisis. If they're convinced that none of what we do matters, show them if somehow they've missed it because certainly we've tried very hard to make sure you couldn't have the things that many of our leading journals are doing to get our research in the hands of practitioners so for instance the journal supply chain management has a relationship with supply chain management review other journals do different things to get research in the hands of practitioners in other words the work we do is used by people they are making decisions with it and if your work can't be trusted you're putting all of that at risk and depending on the topic you research, so in my case, I, you know, I research operation, the safety of operational workers. Imagine if our work was fabricated, we'd be putting people's lives at risk. That is non-trivial. Um, now, this slide's kind of disappointing for me because that's really easy for me to say. 30 years into the career, I'm a journal editor, I'm a full professor. I realize that for some of you, you're in a position where doing these things will be much more difficult. Um, and I would suggest that you have to do something. And if you're not sure what, call Eric or I, and we'll be happy to help. So my concluding thoughts for now. So I'll turn things over to Eric in a second. Many of the conversations we have about the limited value of research are really conversations about the inability to trust the foundations, our theories, facts, and predictions. In other words, our research would be seen as much more valuable if we all knew it was trustworthy, both that it had been replicated and that it had all been done to high ethical standards. If you prefer, you can't simultaneously be bemoaning the lack of impact while p-hacking your way to the least publishable unit. You can't have both. 
Equally, editors do a lot more about this behind the scenes than many of you might realize, but we're not gonna catch everything. And I would argue we shouldn't have to. Um, and then finally, my perspective is this really does start with training. After most of 30 years of working with PhD students, I can't think of a single one who entered the profession with the intent of using questionable practices to inflate their CV. Almost all of them started out wanting to do meaningful, impactful work to the highest standards. They wanted to change the world in some small way, in some cases, some big way. Um, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to. Please encourage this. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Eric. I look forward to hearing what he has to say, and I look forward to rejoining you in about 20, 25 minutes for a discussion. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, Mark indeed had a bit of an advantage uh, having seen my slides before I saw his. Uh, but <laughs> while I indeed think that there is um, quite a bit of overlap, uh, definitely the perspective is different. Uh, I will be taking the perspective from someone reading papers that are already published. Of course, I also have an editorial role in JPSM. But uh, my talk is mostly informed by being a critical reader and not so much an editor or a reviewer. Hopefully, looking at the title, um, you now have a song in your head. Yeah? Which one? The conversation, the little action. Indeed, Junkie XL and Elvis. Yeah. Yeah, so for the, for the rest of the week, have this song in your mind, but of course, with my little uh, twist. What I will start with is contrasting, uh, juxtaposing, that was a word I think we tried to use yesterday in the discussion, right? Yeah. Uh, juxtaposing two uh, different ways of looking at what we are here for on Earth. On the one hand, you could say that science is a quest for discovery, and Mark already uh, also uh, uh, alluded to it. Some of us might think that science is a quest for publishing as much as possible. And I really believe that there are people out there who are in the black part of this slide, that either from the start or probably eh, slowly creeping in as their career progresses, they started to think, you know, if I want to progress as an academic, I have to play the game of publishing as much as possible. So, uh, I hope to be, or at least I joined academia because I thought I was going to be part of a big quest for discovery. Learning about how to do research, learning about the gold standards in all different types of methods, and if you do top quality research, you may uh, at some point make great discoveries, you will definitely make small discoveries, but hopefully also a couple of great ones. Then, of course, uh, it might not be easy to get that published, so you may be able to publish them and then make a good career. But on the other hand, I think there are people who are more thinking in this way. That if you play the game cleverly, you will probably make a good career. You can even publish a lot without making great discoveries. You can even publish a lot without doing top quality research. Now, and publishing a lot of works can be done at different levels. It will be very difficult to be on the right side of this slide and try to publish a lot in the top journals. But there are so many journals out there. It's definitely possible uh, to have a very long publication list without doing top quality research and uh, even with uh, engaging in questionable practices. Where are the current incentives? Unfortunately, on the wrong side of the slide. And incentives are pushing us to publish a lot with the idea that those who publish a lot must be smart people, they need to be promoted to the positions in where they will train and mentor other people, and it's for the greater good of science, and those who publish a lot uh, also get rewarded for it. But this is a, a really a, a mix-up of uh, 
yeah, of, of, of leads and, and goals. And measuring the publication output was meant to identify the smartest people, but it is, well, maybe still identifying smart people, but more the cleverly, uh, the clever people and not the ones that uh, uh, do top quality research to discover, to make great discoveries. While yeah, when I thought an academia was a great place to be, I thought uh, I would do that because of the other side of well. And I still believe that. So when I was thinking this morning about why do I think it's important to talk about this, I want you to lose a bit of your innocence after having spent an hour here, but still enjoy being an academic. I think I've lost a lot of my innocence over the past couple of years, and I still enjoy being here amongst academics, talking about research and with the idea to discover stuff, not with the idea to publish as much as possible. So, um, strategies had to cleverly publish as much as possible. Mark has already mentioned quite a few of them. We start from the most uh, serious ones, FFP. Uh, uh, remember that acronym, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, these are officially recognized as fraud. But there's much more. There is reuse of data across many publications, and of course, doing that secretly and doing it stealthily. P hacking, parking. Um, maybe it's good for you, for those of you who saw parking on Mark's slides, look up the paper about parking, sharking, and tharking, because then you will learn that. And harking is the overall concept. Hypothesizing after the results are known is generally uh, not seen as acceptable. But then uh, the two subcategories were created. Sharking is secretly harking, and tharking is transparently harking. And tharking is acceptable. And that's the post hoc analysis that Mark is talking about. Manipulating the review process, or I like uh, the example that Mark gave. Um, not disclosing uh, a conflict of interest, uh, doing a review for your own friends. But of course, we have, of, of course, sorry, since I've been delving into these kind of uh, practices, I've also learned about um, and journals where you can suggest your reviewers to actually suggest fake names with a Gmail address that happens to be your own email address, authors reviewing their own papers under uh, a different name. It really happens. But this is also why. Many journals don't accept Gmail addresses and the source, and if reviewers are being invited to do a review. So, journals are, of course, uh, uh, as soon as they come, become aware of a new practice, they also implement uh, new policies. Gift authorship. It is possible to purchase a position on someone else's paper. It's even possible for you, if you have a paper almost coming out, to earn money offering other people to be on your paper. There are agencies that intermediate between people with papers coming out soon and people in need of an option. But of course, also quick and dirty research, and if it's quick and dirty, it's probably sloppy, is also a strategy to cleverly publish as much as possible. Uh, investing less time in the preparation of good manuscripts. This is also a uh, questionable practice, of course. So the first three are really considered a fraud. The others are what I would call the gray zone, questionable research practices, pure ones. As many of you know, one of these I've delved into, and I've also written a paper about. So reusing data again and again and again and again and again, again, again and again. And that's something that I've studied and uh, also published about. And this is a paper 2018. This is also the reason why Leo invites me to uh, give talks like this. So in JPSM, uh, I published a paper under the title of Deja Lu, because that's how I discovered it. I was reading a paper and I thought, this looks really like something I've read before. And I started to Google a couple of details of that paper that I was reading, and I found, don't be shocked, 11 other papers using the same data, all published in our journals. 
So I'm talking about JOM, IJOM, IJPR, IJPE, JPSM, JSCM, SCMIJ, 12 papers from the same data set. And after I published this paper, a 13th and a 14th. <laughs> Now, my paper is about two cases, a case of 12 and a case of, at that time, 12, but now 14. And I still track, um, God, on my laptop, I have a set of folders in which I track these kind of practices. So and I start tracking them if I find four, five, or six, then I don't start really worrying yet because I first have to do a really good analysis to see what is the exact data overlap. And it being the same data set is not necessarily a problem, but then I start to investigate what is exactly going on in each of these papers. So I think I've developed a bit of a, a method, a methodology to analyze data we use and to see whether or not it is problematic, because it's not problematic per se. It becomes problematic if the authors engage in a couple of yeah, problematic practices, as I call them. And so, uh, Reuse of the same self collected uh, data, uh, my case, are all survey data, where there is considerable overlap uh, across publications. So I need to map that overlap. I'll show you quickly how I did that. Also in top journals, I think that's important to know because uh, uh, you lose your innocence also in this room because it's not just the lower tier journals, but it does involve journal of operations management, journal of supply chain management. No mention. That's yeah, a problematic practice. If the authors would be completely transparent about it, and all of you reading the 14th paper would know, yeah, then you can also make up your mind whether or not you think the 14th paper yeah, is a sufficient uh, contribution to the literature. But this is done secret. Inconsistent use of variables, ignoring known confounders, tautological reasoning. People, when I tell this, they often cannot believe what is really going on in these papers. So in paper number 10, they use paper numbers four, five, and six in the hypothesis development section to argue that certain variables are related to each other. They build a hypothesis, they test it with the same data as papers four, five, and six. And in the discussion, they use paper seven and eight to say to the reader, our findings are corroborating earlier research which should have been our own earlier analysis of the same data, but of course they don't say that. And they, in the discussion, show that this new study is in line with earlier research, which is the same data with the same authors. Unfortunately, including big names, uh, celebrated people. I'm not going to disclose too much detail. I don't name anyone in my paper, and I'm not going to name anyone here, but um, imagine that part of these groups of authors are full professors with fellowships and associations that some of you might be a member of, lauded people that uh, are uh, being lauded for the volumes of papers that they are able to push out. So this is what I do um, with my, uh, um, once I have four, five, six papers using the same data, I make uh, tables like this. Um, every row is a set of items, and also when items are combined and recombined, you see that some, um, this pointer should work, I think, yeah. So this construct is, you could say, 12 items, but in paper number two, and so each of these columns is a paper, paper number two, the authors use only six of them to uh, build a new construct. But it becomes even in, more interesting that in this paper, paper number six, they start combining even more items into a new construct. And then here, part of the top half and part of the bottom half are two different constructs. Plus, they might not even have the same name. So this uh, multi-item construct, which is identical or identically measured as this one, might have a different name in paper number 12. I think it's quite questionable. And it's really happening, and this is based on real analysis of real papers. Peer-reviewed papers. Peer-reviewed and published papers. Yeah. Now, um, the last time I, I used this in the presentation, someone asked, yeah, Eric, but is the overlap in the DVs or in the IVs? And I thought, okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. So this is new. This is not in my publication. 
I've also now indicated what the dependent variables are in the different sites, because that's what we generally find most problematic. If the DVs are the same, the dependent variables are the same, but the independent variables are different, then the authors know that in later papers they're explaining a certain construct, but they're not including earlier constructs that they know have a positive statistically significant relationship with that. And also for the second case, I uh, quickly plotted what the, the DVs are. So you see that a lot of overlap is in the dependent variables. You don't have to be able to read this, but just to show you in the paper, I identified 18 problematic practices. And that's also what I map uh, when I start investigating a case. I do a data overlap analysis. I uh, do an analysis of which of the 18 practices are being uh, violated. And also, of course, I try to be sensitive to maybe there's a 19th problem that I haven't seen before. But so far, the, the list of 18 works. Two very recent discoveries, because what I, yeah, sorry, what I really enjoy um, <laughs> is following the right people on Twitter and um, discovering via those people new types of practices. And this is an interesting one. It's a bit like a Ponzi scheme, where if you have um, almost accepted, a condition accepted manuscript, and you want to get lots of citations, you can sign up with an agency. That, and that agency will promise you an X number of citations in the first two years, which means that it drives the impact factor of the journal you're publishing, but also you might become a highly cited paper in the web of science. And there are countries where you get a cash bonus if you are an author with a highly cited paper in the web of science. So once you sign up, you get a list of others in the scheme. You get a long list and you can choose, say, the 10 articles that fit best with what you are about to submit as the finally accepted paper. Yeah. Um, they tell you you have to take 10 of those, put them in your paper, and you sneak in one or a couple of sentences in your almost accepted paper with those 10 references that might not be very relevant, but they look relevant. And who's going to look at your paper writing? It's already accepted. The only thing you have to do is get the proofs, the PDF proofs, and proof of them, and you're done. And you send proof that you did it to the agent. The agent puts your article on the list, and that list will go out to other people around the world. And now your paper can get the citations. How much does it cost? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. One more. That I also found quite shocking is paraphrasing tools. Here you see parts of an original paper in 2016 and a paper five years later. And uh, Elizabeth Big, I'll tell you more about her in a minute. I follow her on Twitter, so she uh, uh, she showed this example. A summary of four large studies from this era has suddenly become. A synopsis of four huge examinations from this period. Yeah. Looking at stool samples from 141 Americans, seeing feces tests from 141 Americans, etc. etc. And the giveaway is in the tortured sentences because the second paper uses words and huge examinations. Who would use uh, such a phrase? But these papers come out. This is again a published paper in 2021. Where if you are just a little bit more aware eh, of the, you know that these practices exist, if you start to be more aware of them, you can also call them out if you would, for instance, be asked to review. And, that's, uh, that's and unfortunately, last week, I've been uh, told by one of my colleagues at Arzen that my, our bachelor students are doing the same. One of my uh, supervisors of the bachelor thesis found uh, a piece of text that she thought read very strange, and because she knew the literature, she said, this is almost like a paper I know. And she Googled paraphrasing tool. The very first tool she found, she took, she put the text from the original paper in that paraphrasing tool, and the result was exactly the text that the bachelor students had found in. So with a very quick check, she could actually prove and that the students were using this, this exact tool. Okay, 
I'm going to be a little bit quicker with, well, I'm, actually, I'm, I think I'm going to uh, skip a couple of slides because where am I on time wise? Uh, Five, two, but five, five minutes left. Ten. Ten. Okay. So uh, where can we intervene? I think uh, in that supply chain of paper production. And there's many ways to uh, to draw the supply chain. I chose to do it this way. So we do research. We write it up. We submit it. It's being reviewed. Hopefully it's published. And of course, there are dropouts in the but this is set for the supply chain for successful paper. It's being read and it's being cited. For the part, the last three, yeah, we get rewarded for publishing is, is already good. Downloading is even better. Getting cited, that's the best thing that we can wish for. And also the latter two are also good for the journal. So there's both the authors and the journal. And being rewarded for successful um, yeah, executions of this uh, supply chain. But on all, in all the different steps, things can go wrong. For instance, that work is cited badly. Signing up with a scheme where fake citations are being created, that means that the supply chain breaks down in the final step. It should not have been cited in this. Or a bad review is done. So it ends up, that work ends up in the journal. And, and then from that point in the supply chain, we already have uh, something going wrong. But it could also be that we did good research, but we wrote it up in a very poor way. Maybe by engaging in some p hacking and harking, and I don't know what, then, then already the supply chain fails uh, very early on. And of course, we can do sloppy work, and then it already starts with. Uh, uh, with poor execution of supply chain right from the start. There's examples of uh, all of these problems. I could have, of course, uh, even uh, uh, broken it down to mistakes in each and every step. And then I think Mark and I would be able for each type of broken supply chain to give you concrete examples of what he sees from the editorial role uh, and of what I see from uh, as a reader. Now, some of these bad parts might be due to honest incompetence. You see Katri smiling because that's what Katri and I study amongst deviant behaviors, honest incompetence, but also opportunism. So it could be that these authors simply don't know better. They have been trained poorly. They don't know how to put the gold standards in research are. They've never heard of harking, or they've been told all the time that harking is good. And they, they think they operate honestly, but they're simply incompetent. It could be carelessness and haste. I start to realize more and more now I'm at the level of professor that there's time pressure all the time. I don't, cannot spend that much time on reading everything that my PhD students are doing. Maybe I'm not spending enough time on uh, reviewing the work. So it could also be that time pressure is making the supply chain fail or is real opportunism and gain. And with my cases of 12 uh, slash 14 articles rehashing the same data, I think it's the third one. But in some other cases, yeah, I cannot prove intent. I can, I can only see what comes out at the end of the supply chain. I cannot look into the heads of the people whether it's really intentional opportunism or maybe honest incompetence. And a lot remains invisible. And that's why um, I completely agree with Mark. The word transparency, I think, is the most important term to take home. Ask for transparency from others. Be transparent yourself. Because a lot of details are hidden. They could be hidden because they're generally not reported. Have you ever seen a paper that says, we are now testing these three hypotheses using these variables, but dear reader, our survey instrument also have these 24 variables. No one reports them, right? It would make the message better and stronger and it would be more transparent, but we don't generally report it. So you cannot blame authors for not telling us that there were 20 more variables in there. And of course, you can. But they could also be consciously kept out of sight or even falsified and covered. What can we do? 
Um, I also have, uh, I put it in a slightly different way, Mark also uh, uh, spent some time on what can we do. I think there are different uh, phases in which we can uh, intervene. So of course, uh, at the beginning to prevent and also at the end to correct. And that's my, the final important topic of my talk is about correcting uh, failures. So of course, yeah, we as researchers, we can do a better job at do, executing, writing up, etc. As supervisors and as mentors, we can make sure that junior faculty does better work, writes it up in a better way. And of course, as administrators, we can invest in creating a culture around research integrity and an infrastructure and training opportunities, etc. Slightly more further down, editors and reviewers, that once it's submitted, editors and reviewers should uh, take up the role. But there's still a lot that can be done at the very end. And that's also where I see a role for each of us. And this is also a role that I take very seriously for myself. So critical reading, deciding what to use and what to cite. Please stop citing papers that you don't trust. Why are we rewarding other authors by citing their papers? Simply, we, we need a citation about, let's say, ambidexterity. We go to Google Scholar, we find a paper about ambidexterity, and we cite it because the definition that they use is exactly the definition I also want to use. Please read the full paper and then decide, do I want to reward this author by citing him or her. Yeah? Because your citation is a reward for maybe behavior that should only be rewarded. And maybe it's a bad paper, even if the definition is the one that you need. So my next paper that I, I don't have time to write, but I do want to write, will be a paper about self-correcting mechanisms in purchasing and supply management or slightly wider, maybe purchasing and supply chain management. So, of course, uh, self-correction can be all the way at the start, us becoming more competent, a better culture, a better infrastructure, technology. Uh, all journals, I think, nowadays uh, have plagiarism software to check at least for, uh, for plagiarism. It would be nice if we had some AI to also test for tortured sentences, because that could also then identify questionable practice. Peer review, of course, and make sure that we become good peer reviewers, sign up for peer review workshops. Uh, uh, most journals will have these kind of workshops where you can learn how to become a better peer reviewer. This is one that I sometimes use. If I see something that I don't trust, I will write a letter to the editor of the journal. I think, Mark, I asked you already earlier, how many of such letters do you receive? Letters of concern from readers? Six years, no, none. It's so. six years. Which also Mark has never received. So, no, Eric, you've never me. written me a letter. You don't love me. <laughs> so, they are extremely rare. And I don't understand how it can be that we read. We must read stuff that we don't trust. Now, if it's really bad work, Maybe check it, like Mark said, check it with me or with Mark. That's also fine as a first step. But if it's really bad work, I think this, a letter should go to the journal. My experience is, and it's the same with Elizabeth Big, that journals are very slow to respond. Sometimes they don't even acknowledge receipt of the letter. Sometimes it takes three months to, for them to acknowledge the receipt of the letter. But I, I keep pushing. And I also keep track of letters that I sent out and what happened to those letters. I must also say that most of my letters, nothing happens in the end to the paper, but I will persist. And I, when I see something that I think is not right, I will keep uh, writing these letters. You can do also some other things. Um, I would like you to alert you to Pub Peer. Um, it's a you can say a peer review site for published papers. So anything that's published, you put in the DOI, the DOI, um, the paper pops up and you can write a comment. It's moderated, so you cannot just 
right? That's after you really should ask the question like, oh, I observe in your paper this and that, and it always goes to the corresponding author. So by you posting a comment there, and the message goes to the corresponding author, and they can choose whether or not to respond on the site. It's an interesting site, more so because you can install a plugin that the next time you are on Google Scholar and you find a paper in your browser, it will say, this paper has one, two, eight, 25 comments on Papier. Yeah. Yeah. It works in Google Chrome, at least. So um, I don't see a lot of them, but this would also be something for our field. And of course, uh, uh, all the way at the end, I think there should also be retractions and corrections. If something is really wrong, the paper should be correct, uh, retracted, because otherwise, it keeps on being cited and it's still part of the literature and, and unsuspecting people will still use it. And maybe the very last thing uh, uh, is uh, that the institution also takes action. Now, I feel sometimes like a Sherlock Holmes of science or like Mark said, a data sleuth or uh, people are also called science sleuths. And my inspiring example is, I've already mentioned her a couple of times, Elizabeth Pick. Uh, she retired, she is in uh, uh, biomedicine, so not in our field at all, but it's so much fun to follow her on Twitter. She posts, um, how do you say, uh, yeah, competitions. Who is the fastest to see overlap in figures? So here she has already, uh, the answer is already there. Every color code that you see is duplicated parts in a figure in an academic article. So of course, uh, the, it would be published without all the color boxes and circles. She has a very keen eye for this kind of thing. And she immediately sees overlap and then starts to analyze it more and more. And she had even stuff like this box. That's what she means with this little thingy here. This box has been turned upside down and then used again for this box. And uh, although we are uh, not uh, in biomedicine, you can understand that this is supposed to be an experiment with four different treatments. So there should not be any overlap between these figures. And this is what's happening in our field. If it happens there, how can we believe that our field is completely clean, that Mark has not received one letter of concern in six years of being an editor of such an important journal? start following her because that's how I found this policy scheme. That's how I found the paraphrasing uh, tool that people are using. She's in real, yeah, how do you say, enter, entry into all kinds of uh, questionable research practices. So actually some things <coughs> are happening. As far as I can see on, on Papier, there's only one comment about uh, a paper in uh, our literature. But one is at least the first. There's also been a very recent and rare uh, retraction. Supply Chain Management International Journal. And did you know that they retracted an article? No? It was um, earlier this year or late last year because of the practice that I described earlier, undisclosed data reuse. So this is also a paper from a set of a large number of papers that keep reusing the same data. And in this case, the editor has decided, we are not accepting this, we are retracting the uh, paper. So it also says here, and it has come to our attention that the article uses the same data set as a significant number of authors previous publications. There's also another one that I know of, uh, and already for many years, because we're talking 2008, a retracted purchasing related article in the Journal of Business Ethics. This is a 95% plagiarized article from, if I remember correctly, International Journal of Procurement Management, 95% overlap, and the JBE version has been uh, retracted. That was the, the one that was published later at the, so the, the plagiarized version. And also, it's interesting that in this case, the journal also has installed a ban 
and a ban from publishing in any of the journal publications for an initial period of uh, five years. So not only retracting the paper, but also the author getting uh, other. Yeah, you know you kept the author's name there. Now it only says that the second paper is identical to. Oh. Yeah. But you have to do your eye over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look at mine. Ah, you got other things. Mm -hmm. It's public, and retractions are public, so mm -hmm. it's just out of a little bit of courtesy that that blanked out to me. <laughs> and um, I put this in because Retraction Watch, and that's what also Mark referred to in his title, is a website that tracks all retractions. So they write about the most interesting ones, but they, they keep a database with all retractions in all fields, in all journals. So how many retractions? I know of only three examples, um, the JBE one, the SCMIJ one, and one more in IJPR. I found that one in the retraction watch database. I searched for the word purchasing, procurement, sourcing, and these are the only three hits that I could find with such a, a quick search. Popular comments, I only know of one comment so far. So there's not a lot of eh, post-publication discussion going on in our field yet. Commentaries and critiques in our journals. Do you know of any examples? I quickly start to think about one. I didn't do systematic search yet, but I don't think we do it a lot yet. Letters to editors. How many did you receive, Louise, over in your six, seven years? One. Yeah. At least one. <laughs> but that's, yeah, I think for our field, that's really, yeah, too few. I think. I think we are naive to uh, uh, assume that in those two journals over six years, there's only been one paper that was bad enough for someone to write a letter to. Of course, Mark knows many more, uh, much more about uh, how many cases are discovered during review and how many cases are even discovered at the desk of an editor before it uh, goes out for review. So some recommendations for all of you, become a critical reader, a critical reviewer. Of course, keep up to date with the gold standard. Be very careful joining a project where others have collected the data and they cannot tell you exactly where does it come from, how often has it been used. Without also, again, not mentioning any names, but I'm in a bit of an ethical dilemma. One of our respected colleagues is in my set of folders because there's a fourth paper from the same data set coming out, but this colleague is only on the fourth paper, not on the earlier three. And I'm not sure whether that colleague knows about the earlier three papers. Okay? It's not one of you in this room, but it is someone who could have been in this room. Should I do something? Yeah? Do you think I should email that colleague and say, do you know the data? Yeah, but that person is not at the conference. So. I don't have coffee in your to to more than colleague. But yeah, those are the things that you start seeing. And if you start opening your eyes and, and focusing on certain practices, you also see dear colleagues where they might be walking into a trap, but maybe they know it. So that's that's why it's for me it's an ethical dilemma. I could also be seen as someone like, why are you raising this issue? Are you following me? And what are you suggesting, Eric, by walking up to me over coffee and telling me this? Of course I know. Is there something wrong with it? And then eh, I might be perceived as the bad guy trying to call someone out where in the per perception of the other, nothing is wrong. So it's not that easy to, yeah, to, to think that you are on the right side and others are on the wrong side, or that should I call this out, yes or no? There was actually a question I had earlier because we showed options of things we can do, and I didn't see the option I actually contacted people personally. And I tell them, hey, I discovered this now. And tell them, like, I might send letters now to editors because I see this now, but please tell me. And when you did it, then better retract it yourself. So I don't need to take action. Like, I don't know. I know it's a difficult thing. Um, yeah, but I wanted, wanted to know whether you did this also because you maybe reached out to some of them. 
Maybe you want to do first the good research and find out who all of it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah no, I understand the situation. It was not important. It appear like the shark that is now swimming in the pond and pointing finger. Yeah. I'm almost done. Yeah, cite conscientiously, of course, like I said before, don't reward authors that have when you really don't trust the paper. Um, do a quick search at your own institute. What's the infrastructure? Are there committees I can go to? Are there training programs I can follow myself? I would say follow Retraction Watch. And you can sign up and you get the, the, the emails with the, with the news and install this uh, pub peer plugin. It's always nice to know I'm about to cite the paper. Is there a comment on pub peer? So, there could also be compliments, there could be positive comments on pub peer. So, it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, that's something as well. So, that was what I wanted to add to the discussion.